Welcome to the Plain Talk Podcast. I am your host, Rob Port. Later in the show, State Auditor Josh Gallion is going to be joining us again. I realize I've been talking a lot about this auditor issue, but I think it's an important issue. This week, the, uh, some legislative leaders, the uh, Senate Majority Leader, the House Majority joined via via uh, telephone, uh, the Democratic Minority Leader of the Senate, Joan Heckman, uh, and some others met with State Auditor Josh Gallion to talk about, of course, this controversy where at the end of the session, the legislature rammed through policy to essentially gut the authority of the state auditor and uh, remove from the auditor the power to, to unilaterally begin uh, performance audits. The auditor now has to go hot hat in hand to the legislature to essentially ask permission for it. Uh, coming out of that meeting, I guess the big news was that Senate Majority Leader Rich Wardner said that they're not going to call the legislature back into session to, um, to, to address that issue, which I think is a mistake. But Josh Gallion talks with me a little bit about what happened during the meeting and, and what the fallout is. So you'll hear from him a little bit later in the show. But before we get there, let's talk about China for a moment. Now, obviously, China's been in the news a lot lately because President Trump is busy fighting a trade war with the country. And, well, there's a lot of politics around that. As you might expect, President Trump is unpopular with Democrats, as Democratic presidents are with Republicans. That's all normal. And you're seeing sort of the the normal sort of rote politics around this sort of thing, right, where where the president... um, is trying to implement a policy and his proponents are, are trotting out a parade of horribles about all the terrible things that that policy is, is going to result in. And I, I, I guess that's, that's what's happening with, with China. President Trump has put in place, uh, you know, trade restrictions. China has, has, uh, retaliated and uh, our part of the world has been hit pretty hard by this. Soybeans, you know, is the thing that gets a lot of the attention. Remember back during the 2018 election cycle between Kevin Kramer and Heidi Heitkamp, Republican and Democrat facing off for that seat in the Senate, and suddenly North Dakota soybeans are on the front page of the New York Times because, well, that was the way the Democrats were thinking they were going to lure over red state, you know, Trump-leaning voters who were probably inclined, and, and in fact, as, as we see now from the outcome of that Senate race, were inclined to vote for Kevin Kramer. Now, here's the thing, though, is we're looking at this situation with China so much through the lens of the politics of the moment, right? And the politics of the moment is Democrats don't like Trump. Democrats want to undermine Trump's base of support. And so the thing that Democrats are myopically focusing on is the fact that Trump's trade war is, I, I think it's, it's fair to say, is disproportionately impacting people who live and work in Trump country, right? Farmers and manufacturers, people like that. The Rust Belt, the Farm Belt, people like that. I mean, rural America is Trump country, and the trade war with China is hurting Trump country. But I think that's myopic. Again, I think that's the politics of the moment. Let's zoom out here a little bit. In 1995, then-President Bill Clinton extended most favored nation status to China. Now, It's kind of ironic because during the 1992 campaign, he actually uh, got in some digs at his opponent, George H.W. Bush, uh, for allegedly being too soft on China. But once he got into office and he'd been in office for a few years, uh, Bill Clinton wanted to begin to uh, extend the olive branch to China. And I'll tell you, there was it wasn't just Bill Clinton. It wasn't like this was a Democratic initiative. A lot of people felt this way. This is what Bill Clinton said at the time. I quote, this decision offers us the best opportunity to lay the basis for long-term sustainable progress on human rights and for the advancement of our interests with China. In 1998, under the, again, under the Clinton administration, we extended the most favored uh, nation status with China. At that time, President Clinton said, this decision offers us the best opportunity, uh, or excuse me, I was repeating the previous quote. Here's the actual quote from 1998. Trade is a force for change in China, exposing China to our ideas and our ideals in integrating China into the global economy. In 2000, the United States government moved China to permanent national trade status. And again, President Clinton cheered the move. He said, I quote, we can work to pull China in the right direction or we can turn our backs and almost certainly push it in the wrong direction. Now, this is very compelling stuff, this idea that we could take a country like China, which is run by communists, 
which is a very oppressive, very authoritarian regime. And the idea that, that we can we can help modernize this country, we can help reform them, we can bring them around on issues like like civil rights and make them good global neighbors simply by trading with them, right? Simply by opening the doors to our economy, saying, send us your stuff, we'll send you our stuff, we'll trade with one another, our our cultures will inter- intermingle, uh, our economics interests will intermingle, and, and we'll be better neighbors, and that's compelling stuff. I mean, that's the sort of stuff that works on like the neighborhood level, right? Where you're, you're neighborly, you're, you're lending tools to one another, you're helping one another mow each other's lawn, shovel each other's driveway, lending the, the proverbial cup of sugar, all of that kind of stuff. It makes sense. And for those of us who believe in capitalism, those of us who believe in free markets, one of the, one of the big draws of that is how pervasive capitalism can be. Right. So the idea is we, we open it up and, and how long can a communist regime exposed to the realities of capitalism? How long can that sort of authoritarianism survive? Well, the problem is, as we've learned with China, it can survive for quite a while. Have we made China a better place? Is that nation a greater or lesser threat to American national security, to global security? than it was in 1995. China has used international trade as an entree to wholesale theft of intellectual property. It has become so pervasive. Let me quote. This is FBI Director Christopher Wray recently. He said, I quote, these these Chinese intelligence services strategically use every tool at their disposal, including state-owned businesses, students, researchers, and ostensibly private companies to systematically steal information and intellectual property. And what this means, the reality is cell phones, tablets, televisions, internet routers, all of these consumer electronic devices that are made in China are a security risk because we don't know what sort of backdoors the Chinese may have put in them. Even if it's a a quote-unquote private Chinese com- company, the Chinese communists have their tentacles everywhere. And it's not just the national security threat, right? It's not just China spying on us. It's not just China using access to all this technology to enhance their ability to make war, to enhance their ability to spy on us. It's also that that China hasn't really fixed its human rights abuses. That communist regime has perhaps, according to recent reports, perhaps as many as 2 million people living in concentration camps. According to Human Rights Watch, the country has, quote, dramatically stepped up repression and systematic abuses against 13 million, 13 million ethnic minorities, including Turkic, Turkic, Muslims, Uyghurs, ethnic Kazakhs. In 2018, the president of China, Xi Jinping, He's also been, he's been general secretary of the Chinese Communist Party since 2012. He's been president of China since 2013. He indicated his desire to hold power indefinitely last year by abolishing term limits for his presidency. Which means essentially he can be president for life now. Remember, all of this is happening. China, when it comes to economic and military strength, is second only to us in the world. And that gap is closing. I think we're used to enjoying a sort of head and shoulders lead over the rest of the world when it comes to economic might, when it comes to military might. But China is closing that gap and China is not reforming. Their government is not respecting human rights. Their, their government is, is belligerent. Their, their government is aggressive. And if things continue as they are, they could soon be more powerful than us. They could swing a bigger economic stick on the national stage than even we do. Now, as President Trump fights this trade war with China, we're all talking about the politics of the moment. We're all talking about soybeans. We're all talking about the stock market. We're not talking if about whether or not our our generation's worth of trade with China, our elevation of China into a most favored trading partner with our country, if it hasn't colossally backfired, if it hasn't created a situation where we weren't helping them reform, but instead we're giving an an authoritarian regime, an abusive regime, and a, a belligerent regime a fuel cell on which to grow and get more powerful. 
Instead of putting water on a fire, it kind of seems like we threw gasoline on it. And we're not talking about this because, again, we're talking about soybeans. We're talking about the stock market. We're talking about the politics of the moment. We're framing everything in the context of what might give one side or the other the advantage of the next election. And we need to be zooming out and looking at this long term. I don't know that it should be really about whether or not we get back to a point where we can sell our soybeans into China. I'm beginning to wonder if if we're at a point where we ought to be questioning whether we should be trading with China at all. I don't say that lightly. Making that choice, cutting off China from our economy, or, or even just diminishing its involvement in our economy would hurt us badly. But it might be time. That might be the hard question we need to ask. State Auditor Josh Gallion up next. This episode of the Plain Talk podcast is brought to you by Energy of North Dakota. Oil and natural gas from North Dakota strengthens all of America. And through our abundance of talents, innovations, and technologies, energy responsibly produced here translates to worldwide economic stability. With producers and our communities working together, we're securing a sustainable future that generation after generation can build on. It's all happening right now with Energy of North Dakota. Learn more at energyofnorthdakota.com. State Auditor Josh Gallion joins me. Now, recently, in fact, this week, uh, he met with some legislative leaders, uh, including um, Senate Majority Leader Rich Wardner uh, and Minority Leader uh, Joan Heckman uh, and and others uh, regarding what I'm, I'm sure listeners of this podcast, readers of Say Anything Blog dot com uh, recognize as a you know sort of a, a controversy, if you will over legislation passed at the closing days of the legislative session to require the state auditor to get permission from a legislative committee for performance audits. Now, Josh, uh, first of all, tell me, how did this meeting come to be? I mean, there's there's been, I don't know if I want to call it a war of words, but I mean, there's obviously been some controversy. Whose idea was this meeting? Well, uh, thanks for having me on. Uh, Senator Wardner reached out to me and, and wanted to uh, pull this meeting together and, and have a conversation about kind of where we're at and where we go from here. So how did that conversation go? Well, I think it was a, it was a good conversation. We were able to share, uh, you know, some of our perspectives, some of the concerns that, uh, that, that each of us have, uh, not just with, you know, the change in policy, but we're, we're interested in, um, you know, finding out a little bit more about uh, the, the, perspectives from each of the different uh, groups. The legislature shared some of their issues, concerns with what's going on, and we were able to share some of the issues, concerns with how that policy change impacts the office. I, I think it was a good information exchange. Uh, I, I did learn quite a bit from it. We were able to uh, really put a lot out there. Now, my understanding, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding was that this legislation passed at the end of the legislative session with really no input from your office at all. When and I, I'm, I'm assuming that's correct. Did they explain why when when they came and met with you why this was this needed to be done? They didn't get into any of any of that those just uh, specifics. Again, none of the conference committee members were participating in the meeting, so nobody could really speak directly to uh, the process and why this was added at the very last conference committee meeting on the auditor's budget at a 7 p.m. at night uh, meeting. They, you know, then it was approved by the, on the floor of the Senate the very next day. I think less than 20 hours later, this, this approved, this, uh, approved uh, by the Senate. But no, we didn't get any of the, the specifics. We really just talked about some of the, the bigger issues and concerns, you know, some of the, uh, what's been talked about, the communication issues we talked about. Um, you know, I think some of the other comments have been to try to rein in the auditor's office. Uh, and we were able to talk through a lot of those different, um, different things. So what were their issues? I mean, obviously they, they came to you and, and they're they're justifying this to you. So what are their issues? Well, I think one of the things that I learned is uh, a lot of what my predecessor had, had done, the processes uh, were, were some of the, the biggest things that they talked about. And in the past, the way the auditor's office would put audits out there is we would kind of quietly upload them to our website and then wait for the next legislative audit and fiscal review committee 
to really disclose those publicly because, as you know, those legislative and audit fiscal review committees are public meetings. They they have agendas. They're uh, they're published, um, so everybody can kind of see what's being talked about. Well, I I think that's some of the biggest issues. I think the legislators liked having that kind of prior notice. And one of the biggest things that I've changed in the auditor's office, you know, beyond trying to rewrite the reports to make them easier to understand, uh, but we're also leveraging our, our website, our social media. We're doing press releases and we put that information out there to everybody the minute we have those audits substantially completed. I think, again, as the state auditor elected by the citizens of North Dakota, my focus is making sure that I get that information into the hands of the public. And so I think that's probably the biggest rub was the the change in the way we communicate. And I think the legislature trying to rein in the auditor to I don't know if the intent was to really do that. I just, I'm using terms that other people have used, uh, but it was kind of this slow things down where I'm trying to speed things up and get more information out there. Well, I think people need to understand. I, I mean, to me, you, when you, when you're considering the powers of a given government office, you look at where the mandate for that power comes from. Now we have some government officials that are appointed by the governor, which essentially means their mandate comes from the governor. They serve at the pleasure of the governor and they have some duty to report to the governor. Their mandate's not necessarily directly to the people. They report to the governor who in turn is accountable to the people. You're elected directly by the people. You're not appointed by the legislature. You're not appointed by the governor's office. And so what you're saying is while in the past, the auditor has been sort of deferential to the legislature and held back on releasing audits until they were, you know, delivered to the legislature. You're saying, well, no, I'm elected by the people. When we produce an audit and the report's done, I'm going to communicate that to the people and the legislature can find out at the same time as anybody else, which doesn't preclude you, you know, communicating with the legislature or explaining things or being responsive to members of the legislature when they have questions, just saying, uh, I conduct audits, and, and those audits are going to be available to the people when they're done. Correct. And and to me, that's the way uh, I feel it, it should be done. So that's the leadership that I'm bringing uh, to this office is, is making sure that we communicate directly to the citizens. We make all of our information accessible, uh, understandable. To me, that that's, that's key. If you really want to uh, impact change, and we, we redid our uh, mission statement, uh, to create informative audits to improve government. And to me, the best avenue for improving government is making sure that you've got an informed citizen out there who, who can ask questions. And so while we're not saying that we're not, you know, going to present information to the legislature, to me, Laffer see that legislative audit and fiscal review committee, the, to me, the purpose and the intent behind that should be more as an information exchange. You've got legislators who can have direct access to myself, the auditors, to ask questions to understand what the recommendations were. What, 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 the audit what information, what's the background? Right. Well, well the, yeah, what, what the legislature has to consider, too, when a new audit comes out is, are there implications for pu the public policy that they make? You know, do they need to change policy? Do they need to write a new law? Do they maybe need to get rid of old laws, depending on what the audit is? It's them having that discussion with your office, with you on hand or, or somebody from your office on hand so that they can ask questions and inform themselves and then do their jobs. But their job is not necessarily to stand astride your job because, again, your mandate, your political mandate comes from the people. Correct. And so um, and I, I think in this meeting, when we talked about all kinds of uh, you know different areas, after taking time to kind of digest that, I really think that's that's some of the issue here is, you know, the auditor's office, we over the last couple of years, we've changed how we operate. We have, we have uh, redirected our communication to a much broader um, uh, group. The entire state really is, is, is our focus. And so uh, I, I think, well, I, I wish we maybe could have had this conversation uh, three months ago or somebody could have brought this to, uh, to me and, and maybe asked and we could have um, talked through it and worked through it. But that's, you know, that's in the past. That's, you know, where we're at today is 
they want to approve these audits to, uh, I don't know if it's to slow down the audit process, which I have no interest in, in doing. I am pushing and challenging the staff each and every day to, uh, to do better, better jobs. And, and these folks are, are doing it. I, I couldn't be more proud of the staff in the auditor's office. They are doing great work each and every day for the citizens of North Dakota. Are you interested in going back to the old way where you hold hold off releasing the audit publicly or at least promoting it publicly until it goes before the Lafferty Committee? Do you want to go back to doing that? No, I don't. In fact, if you go to uh, look at auditing standards and if you want to read Section 5410, I think auditing standards, it must be referenced nearly a dozen times. But auditing standards require that the auditors inform not just the legislature, but the governing uh, bodies. The, uh, the, the management, the, uh, and this, and the public is clearly listed in auditing standards throughout is who we communicate these audits to. And so really what I'm trying to do is just adhere to the auditing standards that have been developed by the government accountability office. It's in our yellow book. It's the standards that we follow. I am just trying to adhere to the highest uh, possible standards that we can. So well, no, I don't want to yeah. go backwards. I think we're doing the right thing. Well, this this idea, this idea that that they're not finding out about audits until they're in the media, uh, I'm pretty sure they could sign up to the same email list that I'm on, that I find out about audits from, and and I'm sure my colleagues and in, in the rest of the media find out when you guys are done with the report, you send out an email, you put it out on social media. Lawmakers can subscribe to those things too and find out in real time as soon as the report's done. Get the copy the same time the press does before we even write articles about it. Uh, last question. Senator Warner said, not interested in calling the legislature back into session to fix this. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I, you know, I, I wish we could have probably done something. Um, we will, we will work through it, uh, the best we can. Again, the auditor's office, we adhere to the highest, uh, uh standards possible. We follow the law as it's uh, written. Of course, we're waiting on our attorney general uh, opinion back to fully understand what that means. Any, any idea what the timeline uh, is on that? I have not heard anything from uh, uh, Attorney General Stengem on a response. I believe that they are, uh, I believe they're working through it, and I think they're trying to get it, um, I think they're trying to get it done rather quickly because because of the attention this is, uh, this is uh, received. But um, I just, on, on the previous comment, I do want to say that we notify Legislative Council when audits are completed. So, we notify the staff down there. They could they can disseminate information to the legislators when audits are done. Yeah, uh, we do notify the legislature just like we notify everybody else. Well, it's because, it's uh, yeah. I, I some of the comments they've made. It's like you're it's like you're acting in concert with those of us in the press to like release these stuff and, and blindside people. Which I don't know if you're doing that. You're sure as heck not doing it with me <laughs> because I'm just I'm just getting the press release the same time everybody else does. No, we, we, again, we don't treat anybody, uh, uh, like in a special class. Nobody gets information before anybody else. If you want the information when we upload it to the website, yes, sign up for our news, our, our news releases or our, our email feeds. And that information will come to you and that can go to anybody. You know, it's, it's on our website, nd.gov forward slash auditor. Come check it out. We have, we have more information on our website than the auditor's office has ever done before. In fact, if you want to see what audits we're working on right now and what phase the audit is in, it's on that website. You can see the schedule. You can see what audits we have planned for next quarter. Uh, We have more local government audits available. So again, this communication concern, I mean, we, we have never communicated at this level before. Well, I, I think that's certainly the case. Anybody who really wants to follow what the auditor's office is doing, which I do all the time. I write about your audits when they come out. I track what you guys are doing. It's not that hard. Legislature could certainly do it as well. And uh, and they even have the courtesy of more communication from your office through legislative council or what have you. And I'm sure your office is, is happy to be responsive to lawmakers making you know individual inquiries if they have a particular area of, uh, of concern. They could certainly contact your office directly. Um, Josh, thanks for your time. Appreciate it. We're going to stay up to date on this, but I appreciate you taking your time to, uh, to talk about the meeting. No problem. Thanks, Rob.
That's it for today's Plain Talk podcast. Remember, new episodes of the show come out weekday mornings, although during the summer, as I announced in the last episode, where I, I, I probably won't be doing new episodes on Monday mornings. Instead, uh, I'll be uploading the audio from my weekly segment on the Jay Thomas Show on WDAY AM 970. We have a lot of fun during that segment. I think they should be fun to listen to, but uh, probably not during the summer new episodes on Monday, but the rest of the week, it should be regular as clockwork. If you have any feedback on the show, you got any questions at any time, if you want to send in questions for our weekly guest, Senator uh, Kevin Kramer, Congressman Kelly Armstrong. You can do that at Rob at SayAnythingBlog.com. Get all sorts of update. If you follow my social media feeds, I'm at Rob Port on Twitter. You can find me on Facebook, Rob Port. Say Anything Blog has accounts on Facebook uh, and Twitter as well. Follow that. And thanks for listening. I appreciate it. We'll talk again. <laughs>